Let's talk about mental health. Mental health is increasingly important and something none of us like to address. Are you feeling stuck or does your mind having you dressing sharp but feeling dull? Perhaps it's time to talk to a life coach. Meet fellow WWE podcast listening and wrestling fan Steve from A Damn Healthy Dose of Coaching. Steve is a certified ADHD life coach and getting you unstuck is what he does, period. Working together, he will come up with strategies and provide you with the tools you need to set you on the way. Follow at Damn Healthy Dose on Instagram or X or visit damnhealthydose.com. You can also email Steve, S-T-E-E-V, at damnhealthydose.com directly for a free 30-minute consultation. Mention this podcast, and Steve will provide you with the first two sessions for free to see if life coaching is a fit for you. Again, visit damnhealthydose.com. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants me. This is my iron. You're gonna acknowledge me. Welcome everybody to the WWE podcast. It is Sunday, December 10th, 2023, and we are off to the races here as we are going to jump right into this week, as it was a big week in WWE, and not just because I attended live in Albany, which we happened to fall on the, the the miss week, meaning we didn't get any of the Orton, no Punk, no Rhea, but we got some great wrestling, uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, overall, my experience at Raw on, in Albany was really positive. I enjoyed the hell out of it, and it just keeps me coming back for more. Now, Certainly on SmackDown, that seems to be where the focus has shifted as we got really everyone you could imagine except Roman Reigns. But hey, Roman, if Roman appears, it's just kind of a bonus. No one really expects him to be there anymore. We kind of have forgotten about his title. I mean, it's, it's really crazy when you look at SmackDown. Now, I know next week that Roman Reigns is returning and the crowd kind of booed when they saw the graphic. But I'm thinking to myself, you guys got Orton. You got Punk. Kevin Owens was on the show. Uh, you guys got L.A. Knight and Randy in a tag team match against Solo and Jimmy. You saw an RKO. I mean, what more do you need for a SmackDown in Providence, Rhode Island? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, nothing against Providence, but you guys aren't exactly a big market town. And yet you guys got some massive star power. So more power to all of you. If you attended live in person, you guys got a treat of a SmackDown, but um, we're going to dive into all that SmackDown fun in just a minute. First, I want to welcome a couple of new individuals, Steve Mearing over at Patreon. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate all your support and you you can join Steve and oh, Preston, Preston. I want to, I don't know if I mentioned you, Preston, Preston Logan. If I haven't, thank you so much for joining us and Aaron Crowell. So thank you for all of your support, guys. I really appreciate it. If you want to go ad free and join them, you can do that at patreon.com slash WWE podcast. And uh, that's where you can get all your ad free as well as on Apple or WWE podcast.com. Now tomorrow we're going to be joined by Anthony DeMarco after a week hiatus as I was attending Raw in Albany and we're going to be Talking about the current state of WWE, pick a couple topics and dive right into them. And as we get closer to the Rumble, which is what, six weeks away? Something like that. We're getting closer. Rumble is sneaking up on us. It was suddenly nine weeks, eight weeks, seven weeks, six weeks. I mean, that's what happens, especially around the holidays. And Royal Rumble uh, is going to be a fun one as this week we kind of got an unofficial announcement from Punk that he's looking to win the Royal Rumble. And if that's the case, we'll have to see what Mr. Politician has to say about it. Uh, Mr. Everywhere, hands in every cookie jar, uh, Cody Rhodes, who is playing general manager. He's playing politician. uh, He's playing wrestler occasionally, but mainly uh, he is just effing everywhere. And we're going to get to that in just 
a couple of minutes too, which you guys probably pretty much know what I'm going to say about that. It's becoming absolutely egregious to say the very least. So we'll get into that, but let's dive into a little bit of SmackDown, which came to us, as I said, from Providence, Rhode Island, and it was the tribute to the Troop Show, which always feels weird when it's not in front of troops in their, you know, in, in a rock or something. I guess given the current state of the world and maybe safety concerns, they don't do that anymore, which is totally understandable, but it just feels weird when I know they prominently positioned all service members in the camera section front and center. And I understand that and I appreciate that, but it just feels weird when it's not on a base in the middle of a desert or something. Right. I just, for some reason, but anyway, so again, tribute to the troops. We got a, singing of America the Beautiful from the War and the Treaty. Uh, I have no clue who they are. I am, by the way, completely out of the music scene. Completely out. I've never heard of half of these people they bring in. Never heard of Jelly Roll. Never heard of Bad Bunny. Never heard of War and Treaty. Like, these people just to me are just anomalies. They, they, they just they don't exist until I hear about them. But JBL was on commentary and... Santos Escobar came out. He took on Dragon Lee in the U.S. title tournament match. And you kind of knew who was going to win to this one going in as Santos has been on a roll. And we didn't get a whole lot to hear from him on the microphone, which is a shame. But he did his talking in the ring and the match itself was fine. You know, this was um, this this match actually was a little shorter than I thought it would be in about nine minutes. And it had Santos beating Dragon Lee clean with the Phantom Driver, i.e. the Michinoku Driver, among other names it has been known as. Uh, and, and that's fine. Dom came in after the ring and talked trash and held the NXT North American title over his head and got booed pretty well. Um, Randy Orton was shown backstage getting a fine for his RKO to Nick Aldis the previous week. And he... Uh, paid $50,000, Randy did, to Nick Aldis for the fine. And then Nick said, hey, wait a minute, this is a $100,000 check. And Randy said, this is for the next time. So it's kind of funny. I mean, he's almost, he's paying in advance for his sins. <laughs> That's kind of funny. So another RKO at some point will be coming down the line for Nick Aldis. I'm surprised there wasn't more anger or outrage or some kind of consequence other than just, hey, give me 50K. And wouldn't that be done behind the scenes? Ah, I mean, I'm just... I'm nitpicking. It was still a funny segment. All right. So Escobar uh, advances here. And as he should, as Dragon Lee has kind of been the Rey Mysterio light. He's been the Rey Mysterio with Rey Mysterio out. He's been the kind of quiet underdog, great Lucha Libre style, but never quite Rey Mysterio. But, has been very good and he loses this match here, but Santos is on the rise as a, as a heel. And I think he has a very strong chance to win the whole thing. All right. Then we get some more of the, uh, troops shown at various military bases and Cody Rhodes comes out and here's how he, he was dressed as, as one report put it like an investment banker. That's a great way to put it. He looks like he's you know, an investment banker or he's on Wall Street trying to impress you know, the other suits. He just... I, I am really disappointed in the fans. I have to say as a fan base that the fans haven't really seen through this nonsense yet. I, I mean, I just... He dresses... I understand he's dressed for the job you want, not the job you have. I get that crap. I understand his dad is Dusty Rhodes. I understand we're all supposed to be impressed with his bleach blonde hair that is about 25 years out of date and his crest white stripped teeth that we're all supposed to be impressed by and his well-spoken, unnecessarily, uh, unnecessarily high vocabulary he tries to emote at times. I understand all that. We're all supposed to be very impressed because you can tell that Cody is very impressed with himself. It can't, he can't help it. And every movement he does, everything he makes, everything he says, 
you just feel like he's impressed with himself. You just feel that he can see himself as he's doing this. It's I. And look, I don't need to give you the same spiel as I already have a million times in the past, but it's getting worse. And the fans keep supporting this guy. Now, it was never told why he was even able to be here. He plays GM. Okay. Uh, he, he How many times has he brought over somebody because of his political chips now? He called Randy and he was able to just because that, by the way, if you're a wrestler, you can't just call somebody and have somebody come in. It doesn't have to be, have to be approved by management and bare minimum the GM. So he has some political chips. He's cashed in on Raw to bring Randy to Raw at, the, at that time and, and, and at that time to Survivor Series. And yet Randy went to SmackDown. And then Jay came to Raw because of Cody. I mean, how many, th- how many things? Somebody's got to keep a scorecard here. And now he's out here being the spokesperson for the troops. And he's the face of the troops. What? Cody, you haven't been here for any of the tribute to the troops, by the way, in the last 10 years. Okay. You were injured last year. And you weren't there the year before. And before that, you were Stardust, which was how many years ago? So I don't want to hear from Cody Rhodes. In fact, I don't really need to hear from any wrestler trying to be the spokesperson for the tribute to the troops. The announcers are more than capable of doing that. The video packages speak for themselves, and I 100% support what they do. But to try to use Cody as this conduit for tribute to the troops, and also he's able to switch brands, and that's for, for what? This is where they they want to have their cake and eat it too by making Cody, and I continue to say this, and I don't know how you guys don't see this and be just off-put by it, or you see it and don't care, and that's fine. Then I'll never convince you. But is no one else, no one else speaks against Cody ever being on SmackDown, which he's on like, he's on SmackDown more than Roman Reigns is, and Roman Reigns is a part of SmackDown. I mean, the, the, the Cody's there... WWE, every time there's a major announcement or a big star coming back, it's somehow Cody who is responsible for it. It's somehow Cody who is going to be the spokesperson or announcer for it. Can he just do what he came here to do and that's wrestle? I mean, and and how the fans haven't turned on this yet. Seeing through the cheap smile and the self-satisfaction And now, you know, being there when he shouldn't be there, although fans in attendance don't care because they get to see somebody they didn't expect to see. I'm I'm perplexed. I can't wait until this all comes crashing down. And Cody is like, oh, I don't don't get it. Why, Why are the fans? Why are they turning on me? Take a look at AEW. I know a lot of you don't follow it. The people organically turned on him because of this. They caught on quicker. I'm not saying the fans there are smarter because a lot of the fans that are WWE fans are AEW fans. I think absolutely that's the case. I just think those people didn't want that version of Cody and and cared more about seeing all this crap that they're trying to pull. I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, so Let me just tell you what he said with a very big sigh and an eye roll that you can probably hear. He said he was proud to carry on the tradition and offered thanks on behalf of WWE to all the service members in attendance and those watching around the world. He then introduced a video package that highlighted the history of the event. It focused a lot on John Cena and his participation in the event over the years and then introduced the U.S. Army drill team, which was very impressive, by the way. I mean, absolutely I mean, good God, the way that the, the, the things they did with the rifle, just spinning it around. I mean, I can't even do that with a pencil for more than like three rotations, much less a, a firearm that they rotated like 60 times flawlessly. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But again, Cody now is speaking on behalf of WWE on behalf, on behalf. Oh, it's just, it, it, I don't know what to say anymore, guys. It's infuriating. 
And I can't, I just hope at one point that Cody faces a star that the fans love more. And when the fans are forced to choose, they're going to choose the guy that deserves it. The guy that has an organic love. I don't think there's an organic love for Cody. I think there's still that we, we believe you could be the one to beat Roman. You're still a big star coming from AEW and yeah, we like your song. So, all right, I'm going to move on from uh, the investment banker here. We then got uh, Brad Nessler from CBS Sports joining the announced team for a little while. He's going to call the Army Navy football game that already actually already happened. Uh, I don't know the results, by the way. I won't spoil it if you don't know. Um, we then got uh, he, well, um, Bobby Lashley versus Carrying Cross. And by the way. If you're looking for somebody to make the announcement, why couldn't it have been Nick Aldis or Bobby Lashley, who actually has ties to the military, or John Cena in, a, in some kind of special message, special message to the fans? Why couldn't it have been him? Any of them? Hell, I would even take JBL. God dang! All right, now, Karrion Cross though did come back. He came out with Scarlet and Bobby Lashley took on Karrion Cross. I think Karrion has been out, as one of the announcers said, since August. It feels like forever. And the match didn't last long. Bobby Lashley won with a spear in just under 10 minutes. And the crowd was 100% behind Bobby here. So maybe for the just the moment, just for the night, Bobby Lashley was back to being a mild baby face with the military ties and everything else that goes with that. And... So then he'll be back to being a heel next week. But carrying cross though is really the more of the story as he has been gone, comes back, loses fairly easily in defeat. And now he's going back into the hiding. I, I'm not sure what's happening with carrying cross. Maybe things will get revived next week, but carrying cross right now seems to be a bit on the, on the, on the lower end of the totem pole for WWE albeit he wasn't a match with Bobby Lashley, who is a big star. So, all right, let's move on. The tension continues with Bailey and uh, Kyrie Sane and, and Oscar and everyone else backstage. They seem to be, Bailey seems to be on the outside while she's been ousted quietly from her group without even it being announced yet. Although there will come probably some big blow off and there's distance between them. So, that's going to be fun. It's They're playing the, the slow road on that one. All righty. Where am I at? Let's talk about CM Punk. So he came out, and this is where he, CM Punk clearly listens to, I don't know, I doubt this podcast, but others, or just reads the general gist of, of X or Instagram and gets the vibe for what the fans are saying as a collective. And he addressed some of those concerns, some of those criticisms of his promo that he hit on um, Monday Night Raw two weeks ago when he first returned, which was generally looked at as kind of a a bit of a disappointment in length. So he addressed that first, but he did uh, say that, you know, uh, JBL's here and uh, JBL did call Punk a superstar that transcended the genre and... Punk said he has good news, though. He's at the top of the hour and not the end of the show, so he can get he can't get his time cut. So there's your first criticism answered. Realizing, hey, I got my time cut because I was at the end of the show. Now this won't happen. So Punk then uh, encouraged the crowd to continue chanting, and then he asked the crowd where he should sign between Raw and SmackDown. Being a SmackDown crowd, the answer was obvious, but I always love it. This is where brand loyalty is completely an illusion. If you're attending SmackDown and someone's on SmackDown saying, oh, should I sign with SmackDown or Raw? All of a sudden, everyone in the crowd has loyalty to SmackDown as if Raw had come to town. They wouldn't have come to Raw and done the same thing for Raw. It's not like SmackDown is the only show that comes through your town. WWE usually rotates it. So there is no there's no brand loyalty here. It's all a farce. And it's always weird when the crowd reacts like, should I sign with Raw or SmackDown? The crowd, in reality, should go, I don't know. I don't care. I'll, if Raw comes here, I'll be at that show. If SmackDown comes here, I'll be at that show. Yet somehow, there's a weird 
very temporary brand loyalty that encapsulates everyone when they go to us go to a show and they think wait a minute uh i should cheer for him to sign on smackdown because i'm i'm at smackdown it's like yeah you are you're at smackdown but you'd be saying the same thing about raw if it came to town too so don't tell me that you're brand loyal it's always bizarre it's I ne- <laughs> you know like people in reality should answer that by going like literally saying nothing and saying i, I don't care <laughs> what the hell do i care i'll still be going to the show no matter what brand you go on and sign on it's weird but uh let's see he said he asked then if he should throw 29 of the men out of the rumble to main event wrestlemania yeah so he really went from talking about what to who, which was good. And the crowd chanted punk then moved on and said, people don't like this happy go lucky punk. And so he was going to be the controversial punk. They all love another criticism. Number two is that that happy go lucky. I'm home punk. He answered and said, okay, you guys don't want me to be that. I won't be that. And I understand that, you know, that, that that was one of my own criticisms, too, is he feels like he's a betrayal of his of himself. And what made him popular is the exact opposite of not I'm home, but uh, I'm here to rage against the machine. I'm raging against the, the man. Um, now, would that work, though? Who is he raging against now? Who is he going against? What's he here for? I mean, I don't need him trying to oppose who Triple H. That's not going to happen. Vince is gone. So who is it, who exactly is he opposing right now? You know, it should just be whoever his opponent is. Keep it simple. But uh, we then got uh, referencing to Cody Rhodes. He said, you know, what do you want to talk about? And, you know, said he's got some stories about Cody Rhodes, to which the crowd just went, meh. We just saw him. <laughs> Punk then talked about Roman and made reference to him never being there. He brought up being the OG Paul Heyman guy and that he was punk's wise man before he was yours that was really good he then credited the usos and credited jay and um, he questioned whether he and uh, he could trust randy to back him up or l a knight yeah he brought up K- ko and said he wasn't sure about him either because who wants to be around someone who punches people randomly backstage and punk finally referenced seth rollins Although he didn't say Seth Rollins' name, he said that even that guy wasn't the man of his own house. Whew, yikes. He then said he had the decision to make over the weekend about choosing which brand he would sign to and called himself a monkey wrench in the plans of everyone he spoke about tonight. And he made a promise to main event WrestleMania. Wow. Okay. So this to me i know this this particular promo some people are calling it a ramble rambly i i i don't think it's rambly this is exactly what we wanted from punk to me this should have been his first promo i mean really but we we got the promo that i wanted and many of us were looking forward to and we're looking for punk to finally get a a hold of a program here find out who he's going to work with first who is that going to be it's probably not Roman, as Randy Roman's slated for a Royal Rumble. So he's probably going to enter himself into the Royal Rumble. And Cody is also in the Royal Rumble. Uh, you know, I, I don't know any other entrance. I'd imagine KO is another one. You know, I, I mean, who the hell knows? Maybe even Gunther's in it. He was in it last year as the IC champion. <laughs> we got a lot of big names to go here. But this was a promo that needed to happen. He needed to mention names. Seth Rollins is probably the guy to beat him or face him at WrestleMania. But if Punk is truly on a path for the main event of WrestleMania, what happens? Is it Seth versus Punk for the title, world title at at WrestleMania? Is that considered a main event? It should be. And if it's for the world title, is Seth heel? Maybe. Where Punk's trying to take the title. This is a really crazy WrestleMania season, as I've said for so long. It's a lot to look forward to here. Charlotte versus Asuka was next. And the match was weird. (laughs) Uh, Six minutes and 40 seconds. The announce team, um, you know, said that Charlotte had taken a bad fall on her neck during the break. And she was slow to get up, but was able to apply the figure eight. 
and Bailey appeared from behind and broke up the hold. And Charlotte got up and set Oscar into Bailey and attempted to follow up with a strike. But Oscar moved and Bailey hit got hit with the elbow, and Oscar got uh, rolled up Charlotte for the victory. So this was clearly an injury ravaged match. So I'm not gonna hate on this match at all. I mean, this is really a rare mistake from looks like really Oscar on this one, but probably partially Charlotte. And they, you know, she fell from the, the rope and landed very awkwardly, and it did not look good. And it's not on the Hulu cut, <clears throat> but you can go and watch it on on YouTube. And uh, we just hope uh, Charlotte's okay. It seems like she is. If she was able to continue the match, but uh, I'm sure she's getting checked out. And you know, best wishes, of course, to her and and you know, making a full recovery, making sure nothing's wrong. And <clears throat> of course, um, Oscar also making a very rare mistake. Very rare. I mean, this is a. Uh, this is the risk, man. You know, this is the stuff that you forget when you're watching matches can actually happen and the things that you don't want to happen. Um, now, this wasn't catastrophic, but still scary as hell. And the, the fall, phew, not good. Not good. But Oscar uh, gets the victory here. The quality of the match is not really in consideration because of the injury. But um, Charlotte Flair loses. So... We'll take that for what it's worth. I don't know if Charlotte was supposed to win or not, but the roll-up would indicate that they were going home to just get Asuka the victory the further the story. So I would think Asuka was supposed to get the victory anyway. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. After the match, Cody Rhodes spoke to CM Punk backstage, and Cody commented how they're both aiming to win the Rumble. All uh, right, I already talked about that. And Roman Reigns is scheduled to return next week in Green Bay. And by the way, I know CM Punk did appear on, on NXT. He talked to Shawn Michaels. I'm aware of that. So, uh, of course, there's zero chance he's signing with NXT. Let's be real. LA Knight and Randy versus Solo Sokoa and Jimmy Uso was the main event. And this one was 11 minutes long in a match that really had some nice hot tags for both LA Knight and Randy Orton. I was glad that they didn't just give the hot tag to Randy Orton, that Randy Orton did need LA Knight. And I'm the most, what I'm really concerned about here is LA Knight's momentum. Because before Orton or Punk returned, he was the guy. He was the guy that's on the ascent. He's the guy that's on the rise. He is what he says he was. He was the fastest rising star in WWE. And then you get two megastars, pun intended, but literally, Punk and Orton returning. And by the way, Orton is on your brand. Punk was on your brand. He probably will sign with Raw, but you know he gets a little bit overshadowed here. And with LA Knight not also getting any mic time, you're a bit concerned for him. However, you listen to the reaction, and he's getting very big reactions still, even on a show with two guys that are as big as Punk and Orton. So it's still encouraging for LA Knight. The LA Knight, yeah, stuff is still alive. Is it as white hot as it was before Roman? No, but it's certainly a respectable level that you can continue to uh, move up. And if I'm looking at the rumble here, my three favorites are the three guys that we know are probably in it, which is Orton, or I'm sorry, uh, Punk, Rhodes, and Knight. Now, Knight hasn't mentioned the rumble, but I can't imagine him in any other position other than the Royal Rumble at this point, because Randy Orton is going to face Roman. Punk and uh, Rhodes said they're already in. LA Knight doesn't have a path with anyone individually, so you would think that uh, we're going to have an LA Knight maybe in the final four at least, maybe final two to uh, close out the, um, the the rumble. So, but other than, other than that, though, the match itself was good. The, beyond the hot tags, uh, the mention of John Cena's career supposedly being ended by Solo was nice. The callback to Umaga was also a nice throwback, them mentioning the similarities about um, re- regarding the late, great Umaga um, who I don't think got the credit he deserved in the moment, um, which, uh, you know, if you go back and look at Umaga in the mid 2000s, really was a, a fun heel as he went through the ranks. Before that, he was part of Three Minute Warning, if you remember that during the Eric Bischoff GM era. But um, good, good tag match to close. Randy Orton, of course, getting the RKO is always fun. And you notice Solo Sokoa is still protected. Solo Sokoa has yet to get an RKO. So that leads you to want it to happen. So I like it. 
All right. Overall, SmackDown, star-studded show. I mean, you got Cody Rhodes. You didn't expect to be there. If you're in person, you love it. JBL, of course, on commentary, if you care about that kind of thing. But Orton and Punk were there. And Knight was there. Kevin Owens, to some degree, was there. Uh, you know, just a star-studded night. The announcement of Roman Reigns for next week. A lot going on. And we'll have to see what Roman does next week. I would imagine he's going to directly answer Randy Orton and his challenge. So on the raw side of things, again, uh, I was in person here uh, for the event, but the biggest takeaway from the whole show, as I've said, has been from raw last week, very high quality wrestling, longer matches, but high quality pay-per-view closing matches, specifically the Jey Uso, Seth Rollins world heavyweight championship match, which was just, um, another level here, especially for a Monday Night Raw. And both of them knocked it out of the park. And for me, yes, Jay didn't win. But they exceeded not just the back and forth and near falls, which were insanely convincing. Even for myself, who is a, um, you know, and I'm not trying to, I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. Ever, you know, There's people who have been watching wrestling way longer than I have and have a higher knowledge of it. But when they can trick even the the hardcore fans into thinking that, oh my God, there could be a title change here, even when you think there's no chance going in, they've done their job, and then some. Because some of those near falls that Jay hit with his uh, multiple finishes were convincing. And I thought that could have been it for Seth. And it wasn't. And beyond the all that, though, and beyond the chemistry, <clears throat> beyond that, we really saw Jay Uso arrive truly arrive, not just physically on raw. I don't mean in a physical way, more of a, more than kind of like a, <clears throat> um, a main event player way, truly living up to main event. Jey Uso. That is what to me was the most important thing coming out of this. Not that he didn't win the world title. That'll come, but that he established himself as a true solo act, not as a, Oh, well, the Usos are temporarily split. Uh, they'll get the most out of that, that they can. And then they'll get back together. Cause that's, that's when they're at their best. No, I, I mean, right now I have, I wouldn't have any plans of bringing the Usos back together. Even if Jimmy was also a baby face, I wouldn't do it right now. Jay is a guy that you could really hang your hat on and say, he can provide a quality main event. Yes, it was with Seth Rollins, but he still did his part. And also, oh, by the way, Yeet, apparently WWE has bought the copyrights to. Smart choice. Because Yeet is back. There's no more questions about it. They can sell the shirts. The Yeet stuff <clears throat> is um is gonna it's it's already caught fire. Maybe to the level of the yeah stuff with LA Knight. I don't have the figures and dollars and cents in front of me, but based on the crowd reaction in Albany, it was the most over thing in Albany was Yeet and the the hands up and down that thing he does. That was infectious. And it was a lot of fun and it was mega over. Mega over. More than Seth Rollins song, more than uh, the investment banker's song. It was just infectious to be there. And as the, as the match went on, they brought us in even more and more and more. And I'm sure even at home, you guys watching could feel it and being there live again. I know it wasn't a WrestleMania main event. I know there was no title change. They still aren't the biggest stars on the roster, but this is what great pro wrestling is and looks like. And that's what we got in a main event on Monday. Am I a little bias? Sure. But that's how I felt. However, the other big thing that happened was McIntyre, who continues to solidify himself in the heel role. He's there, too. Drew has also arrived on the opposite side of things in the heel role as fully heel. He's not tweener anymore. He's there. And that was also a message I drove home on Monday in my Raw review, or Tuesday, rather, in my Raw review, is that Drew McIntyre is now truly full heel. And he attacked Jimmy, or I'm sorry, Jay and Seth after the match. And that leads me to believe 
that either at Rumble or before, we're going to have a triple threat for the world title with Jay, Drew, and Seth. Sammy's written off TV. He's no longer there for a little while, maybe returning at the Rumble. But for now, it's probably going to be a triple threat for the world title. And in that match, I think if that match happens, whether it's on Raw or at the Rumble, there is significant chance that we have Seth Rollins drop the belt. Very significant. In fact, I'd say it's slightly favored. And that person to, to win it would be Drew McIntyre. That's my best guess. So we will have to see how things transpire. But to me, that looks like the, the most obvious place to go is a triple threat. The good thing about it was the interference on Raw didn't interfere with the match itself. It was the after uh, after the match was over, which was a really it, that was a nice, nice idea. Nice choice. And he, um, you know, also drew hurting, quote unquote, Sami Zayn to write him off TV. Very good for his character. The way he viciously attacked the knee of Sammy, getting sensitive about Sammy bringing up his family. All well done. McIntyre is in a really good place. Sammy Zayn is in a really good place still when he, even when he comes back. Uh, things, guys, just. I'm not saying it's great all the way around. Let's be serious. I mean, you have a women's division that's also that's it needs some help. But things generally on both brands are clicking in a way that I haven't seen in years. And this is going to be so much fun heading into the Rumble and WrestleMania season. So uh, we did get Drew and Sammy as I go down the line very quickly here. And McIntyre ends up beating Sammy in 20 minutes. That was a long one. 20 minutes to open the show with a Claymore and a chop lock. See, that was the key. It wasn't that McIntyre used like an underhanded tactic behind the referee's back. He just used kind of a low brow maneuver. Uh, kind of like, ah, oh, you little, like, you know, it, it's just well done. The chop lock. I don't think the chop lock is used enough. And that was very a very nice touch to the finish of that match. Uh, all right. So we also got, I'm going through matches here. Uh, Nia Jackson, Shayna Baszler. I went through this already, you know, in more detail on my raw review. Nia Jax did beat Shayna. And I already went through this. Why I liked, or I didn't like it. Why the crowd didn't seem to give a damn. And it's not even just because I personally don't like Jax or anything about her weight. She's like, these two don't have a personality, really. Especially Shayna right now doesn't have a personality. She has no direction. Naya is just this uh, super annoying, um, you know, uh, obviously dominant woman in the women's division. But even Nia Jax doesn't have a whole lot of depth to her character outside of just having this snivelly, whiny voice. But Shayna Baszler doesn't either. And, and Shayna Baszler, I just want her as a killer. And to me, we haven't seen that in a long time. I mean, when I look back <laughs> at some of her biggest moments in the last like three, four years, I unfortunately think of Lily. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? During the pandemic era, when Lily, who was at that time, Alexa Bliss's doll that kind of came to life and winked at people. Remember that garbage? And Shayna Baszler went backstage and suddenly no one was there. And it was like she was in a nightmare and she got trapped in a room with a doll and she's scared. I mean, remember that? Oh, I do. And I feel like ever since that time, Lily put some kind of hex on her. And she's no longer able to like, yeah, be relevant in WWE for any, any uh, significant period of time. So it's not that Shayna can't get back on the horse, but they don't give her anything to work with. Very rarely. So we'll see. Um, I, I, I still believe that we're going to get to a Nia Jax and Jade Cargill match. It's probably probably what we're looking at. And, and at least a confrontation at the Rumble when Nia Jax is dominating and she's throwing people out left and right. And Jade Cargill comes out. And then someone says, oh, there's someone she's not going to be able to just toss around the ring. Right. So I'd imagine it's going to be set up like that where Nia Jax is dominating the women, 
nobody can stop her. Nobody can throw her out. And then here comes the, uh, you know, the, 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 the model who she's, you know, again, I think she's more interested in modeling than she is wrestling. That's another topic, but that's probably how they're going to introduce her. And she'll get a big pop and probably throw Nia Jax over. And then Nia Jax will eliminate her. And then we're off to the races with those two in a possible program towards chamber elimination chamber. So it's my, again, it's, we're four steps ahead. I understand, but I can't help that sometimes. All righty. So then we got DIY versus Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci in a best of three falls. First fall went to Ludwig and Giovanni Vinci. Second went to Gargano and Champa. And the third also went to Gargano and Champa in 15 minutes. They won the match. Really good match here. One that Gargano was more over than Champa was. A lot of there was some Johnny wrestling chance. Um, <clears throat> one that uh, really brought the crowd in. And I think I said this on my raw review too that the, this match to me was one that people were weren't really like super excited about, and they were just kind of like, "Yeah, we'll get some good wrestling." As the match went on, the crowd got more and more invested, and that's all you can ask for. And all you can really do as a talent, you can't do anything else other than that. You can't just go on, you know, on a whim and go into business for yourself and grab the mic and cut a promo. You got to do your telling and storytelling in the ring, and that's what they did here. So. All right, we then got, again, I know I'm skipping a lot of backstage stuff, but you can hear about that on my Raw review. Caden Carter and Katana Chance versus Tegan Knox and Natalia. <clears throat> By far the quietest match of the night in four minutes and 45 seconds. But what do you expect? I mean, like you've done zero, zero. If you could do negative character development, that's probably what you do here with Caden Carter and Katana Chance. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, Tegan Knox and Natalia, another just kind of like ragtag team that are just there because they don't have much going on either. And honestly, no one really cared about this match. I, I they just didn't. So um, there's that. The only the, the one good thing was Chelsea Green. OK, people were into Chelsea Green. Chelsea Green is entertaining. No doubt about it. All right. We got uh, Julius Creed and Brutus Creed, the Creed brothers, <coughs> with Ivy Nile versus Dom and JD. And that match went 11 minutes and 15 seconds with the Creed brothers coming out on top. And it's such a joy to watch this, the, the Creed brothers in action. We already know what JD and Dom can do, but the Creed brothers are just a throwback team, man. They are going to be a big deal. They will... I mean, without question, are going to be future undisputed tag team champions. It's just they're such a joy to watch. They're just natural raw athletes. I just don't know how else to put it. All right, we got Seth Rollins and Jey Uso for the world title. As I mentioned, I don't even want more to say about it. Uh, this match was uh, just so well done, and for a free TV match. I mean, they over delivered and it was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, I know also Shinsuke Nakamura addressed Cody and Cody was talking about how, oh, you think we're the same, then prove it. And that was his mic drop moment. That's really all we got. Shinsuke didn't appear live in person. Uh, it was just kind of a promo battle between the two. So that's where we're at. That's our week in review, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it as we roll into this week, as we get closer to the Rumble in about six weeks. And um, we've got a lot to come. Tomorrow's the current state, Tuesday's Raw review, Wednesday's the mailbag. And some of you, by the way, have been asking me, hey, how do I get in? How do I contribute to the mailbag? Here's how. You can email me, mailbag at wwepodcast.com. Or you can call us. The, call, the number, since none of you are going to write it down, just copy and paste, right? <clears throat> the description notes of our mailbag shows. The number's right there. Okay. So do that. So, uh, all right. Well, get on over to Patreon if you want to go ad free at patreon.com slash WWE podcast or on to our WWE podcast.com website and go VIP. You also have Apple podcasts. You can go ad free there with a little button that says ad free. Who knew? All right. That'll do it for me here on the WWE podcast. Uh, the weekend review. I hope everyone's weekend went well and we're off, uh, off and going here on another week. 
Everyone enjoy it. Take care, and I'll talk to you next time. Let's talk about mental health. Mental health is increasingly important and something none of us like to address. Are you feeling stuck, or does your mind having you dressing sharp but feeling dull? Perhaps it's time to talk to a life coach. Meet fellow WWE podcast listening and wrestling fan Steve from A Damn Healthy Dose of Coaching. Steve is a certified ADHD life coach, and getting you unstuck is what he does, period. Working together, he will come up with strategies and provide you with the tools you need to set you on the way. Follow at Damn Healthy Dose on Instagram or X, or visit damnhealthydose.com. You can also email Steve, S T E E V, at damnhealthydose.com directly for a free 30 minute consultation. Mention this podcast and Steve will provide you with the first two sessions for free to see if life coaching is a fit for you. Again, visit damnhealthydose.com. Thanks for listening to the WWE podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.